Uh, the brain is a creativity machine. We spoke in an early program on vision, how the information coming through the eyes, through the retina, are incomplete for me to get a complete picture of Charlie Rose. You know, I see the outlines of your face and I add additional features as a result of my exposure, my looking at faces. So this is what the brain recreates the outside world. Is there an explanation for why there have been bursts of creativity at certain places at certain times? Mm. Well, I think both of them could speak to that very much. There is no question that the myth of the isolated genius in the studio is quite inaccurate or incomplete because I think the generation of these two and many others, whether you're talking about, in fact, the abstract expressionists or the French impressionists or um, Florence in the right. Italian Renaissance, it's the togetherness that is such an important factor. It's the rivalry with your colleagues. It's the desire to support each other. It's what you get from seeing what they're doing. It's talking and talking and talking. Creativity needs what? I think for people who are making and doing, when you're actually making and doing something, you don't think, I'm creating. That's not how, at least I don't. I don't think, oh, now I'm creating. I think that certain aspects of what I would like to find out about my own experience in doing and making um, lead to develop certain processes that will allow me to have a certain feedback that will allow me to continue. When I first started uh, in New York, I just wrote down a, a list of verbs and I decided I would enact the verbs in relation to material, in relation to place, and in relation to sometimes even time. So I would take very simple things and I would either roll that up or lift a piece of rubber up and I would call them to roll, to lift, to hang, to bend, to tie, to dapple, to twist, or whatever. And I thought by just using a very simple transitive verb structure, it would allow me to enact processes and motor control in relation to material that would then allow me to proceed in a way that I didn't have to deal with the specifics of history. It would allow me to have an own intrinsic logic in relation to what I was doing, in relation to the perception of what was the residue of the activity. Now that doesn't mean that all activities and their residue are going to create something that is um, satisfying in terms of what you would call an aesthetic experience. Most of them not. But every now and then, you would have a moment where you would say, aha, I've done this, and this satisfies certain parameters of what I can then relate to in things that have been done before, but not, no precedent for it. The immediate generation that had come before had dealt with the hierarchy of the object and they weren't involved with the process of the material. And they had specific intentions. Well, I was more interested in my own physical experience than somebody else's intention. I wasn't interested in script. I was interested in how I could physically interact with material and what the residue would be in terms of anyone looking at it being able to reconstruct what had been done. Whether or not that was satisfying aesthetically for other people or not, at the point, at that point, didn't um, concern me, and I, I was working with various people. I had a small trucking company, so it was myself, Chuck, uh, Phil Glass, uh, Bob Fiore, Michael Snow, Steve Reich. So there were a lot of painters, um, sc other sculptors, filmmakers, musicians who would help me, mm -hmm. and there was a dialogue that went on between us that was involved with process, time, movement, place that um, didn't really adhere to any discipline. So there was an interconnectedness in the language that we all shared, and there wasn't any competition about one outdoing the other because we were all involved with a similar language, which up to that point really hadn't hit the museums. We were doing the work for each other. But I, I think in terms of uh, you know, how we ended up doing what we're doing, I think there's a, uh, a common misunderstanding about how uh, generations of artists uh, uh, move um, away from other people's work. There's a commonly held belief that we're reacting against work that we find bankrupt, uninteresting, devoid of any value, and therefore you go out and make something else. Uh, 
I thought we, we loved all those people so much. <laughs> and uh, we thought we were going to be doomed to be uh, followers if we continued to make work that looked like everyone else. Our generation really wanted to create something that was not familiar. And I think um, to make something that is unfamiliar is actually to probably to make something new and to create something. To make something familiar is to deal with facts that have come before. And um, in watching the segments of these pro this program, uh, I didn't watch the last few, but I was struck that the passion of scientists trying to deal with something in relation to the given history of facts and then offering something new, I think is probably um, fairly consistent with how a lot of artists work. Well, one thing that both artists' work shares to a really interesting extent for me, thinking about how different they are, is the priority on the viewer's experience. And I think Chuck's paintings, if we could look at the Roy Lichtenstein portrait, um, there is obviously a back and forth in these pictures between the abstract marks, the painting act, and the representation of somebody. And neither one is the whole experience. Part of the experience is the abstract circles and squares and funny shapes that you see in the mm. detail. And Wonderful. then part of it is, oh, but here's this person. And for Chuck making it, but as much or more for the viewer looking at that painting, one is made to become aware of one's own perception and one's own use mm -hmm. of one's perception because you have to look at this painting up close to see the free abstraction mm -hmm. of the brushwork, of the shapes that are made, the color forms. And then you, you step back to see, oh, there's Roy Lichtenstein. Mm -hmm. And the process that you went through in making it is so embedded in the painting that as the viewer, yeah, you the are evidence. almost made to recreate it. And both of us, all the evidence of its own yes. making is right there yes. in the work itself. The the fact that there are incremental units, which is true from the very beginning, even the continuous tone paintings were made in incremental uh, units, is also driven by my learning disability. I was overwhelmed by the whole. I didn't have any, uh, wh how am I going to make a head, how am I going to make a nose, I, it's too uh, overwhelming, uh, it makes me too anxious. Uh, but if I break it down into a lot of little decisions, lots of, this was a coping mechanism that I used all the way through uh, through school in everything that I did. Uh, take something uh, overwhelming and, and anxiety provoking and make it into little not so scary decisions and have it be a positive uh, experience because every time I did complete a square, I didn't have to wait till the end to get pleasure. I could solve one <laughs> little problem at a time, and the pleasure came with 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 each with each one of those. And this is um, uh, this was uh, very um, you know reassuring. But I decided that I wanted to do a horizontal vertical grid, so your eye would splash down those shapes like water over rocks on a waterfall. And even though the nose would be the same in either case, it was an entirely different experience. And uh, that's, you know, you're trying, I'm an orchestrator of experiences. That's what I try to do. I mean, I think it's very rare for a painter or a sculptor to be as explicit about that um, interest in the viewer's experience. But I mean, Richard, for you to imagine, it's the opposite. You didn't get any step-by-step uh, -step gratification at all. And for you to be able to go from an idea in your head to what it is when these things are complete, that will make the viewer's experience be what it is you are envisioning it to be. Can you at all describe that? Um, I went from ver very simple things. I went from um, conical shapes which were inverted that would allow shapes to lean away from you or if you turn one upside down they would lean toward you um, to then dealing with um, torque shapes. And it evolved into a series of torqued ellipses and torque passageways where the viewer is experiencing a space um, that he's implicated in that is somewhat startling in that they have no um, previous information that would allow them to understand the complexity of a curve leaning toward you and away from you uh, in its simultaneity as you move through. And it gave me a big opening into developing a language.
but it, it's always in the, the process of working itself that Absolutely. ideas lead to other ideas for me because the work isn't scripted or confined only to um, its notion of making, but in the process of um, it revealing itself to me is when I learn what is possible that I hadn't foreseen in what I projected. And um, one doesn't want to become a slave to one's own precedence, and the way to get around that is to constantly stay aware and ask questions about what it is I'm looking at and what it is I don't understand. And oftentimes when pieces are coming together, you see things that you could not have imagined and they push you in a different direction. The same for you, Joe. This is very important. Um, I've always said, uh, for a long time, I've said inspiration is for amateurs. <laughs> the rest of us just show up and get to work. <laughs> That's good. That's great. Because That's everything great. grows out of work. Absolutely. You do something, and that kicks open a door, and you look through that door, and you go, I want to go there, yes, so you right, move right through. Everything comes, uh, comes from uh, that, um, uh, that kind of approach to, uh, you, yeah. know, you don't want to sit around and wait for the clouds to part and be struck in the head with a bolt of lightning because it may never happen. You don't sit. You don't get up in the morning and say, "I have to be creative." Right. No. <laughs> it's, not word, it's not a word that we use. You don't, I'm sorry, you don't even we use don't the word. Use it, and we don't use inspiration, and we don't use terms like that. So it only happens when you do what? Sometimes it's because you put yourself in a position where you're more likely to bump into something. Did you once tell me that the creative process that you engage in, whatever word we use instead of creative process, creating art, mm -hmm. making art, uh, you only take it halfway? then the person who receives it takes it the rest of the way. Uh, yeah, well, actually, Duchamp said that. The artist had only 50% of the responsibility. I never and that, interviewed Duchamp. <laughs> and, uh, and that was to, to put the work out. But the piece was completed when, he, when the viewer right, returned right. it uh, to the artist. And we are in a business of visual communication. I, I think this is a very important point because it also points out that creativity insight is not just the, the artist's domain. The person who responds to the art also is undergoing a creative process. And part of the pleasure is the working through of what the art means to them. Mm -hmm. What do we know about the biology of creativity? Um, well, well, in a word, not, not too much. Not too much. <laughs> um, um, but it certainly entails the lifting of various inhibitions and restraints as well as, as, well as stimuli. And uh, you were speaking before about the two halves of the brain and how different they are and uh, and certainly when the left half of the brain which is more concerned with language and abstract thought gets damaged as it may in some diseases or with a stroke you may have a release of uh, of perceptual powers and artistic powers from from the other hemisphere but uh, do you think the fact that we both have face blindness, is there a, a, an area of damage in both of our brains um, that yes. can be pointed to? Yes. Yes, I, 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 I say that not area. so much damage as a, a failure it's of failed. development. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, and a failure of development in, in areas which are similar to those in people who've had strokes or whatever and suddenly lose facial recognition. The, um, I think the problem that Chuck and I may have with the word creativity is that seen from the outside it seems like a very exalted term and people mm. you know attribute various status symbols to it or whatever seen from the inside it's probably an unending question mark if not a, a paranoia and a, um, Paranoia or sublimation, and that—that's an interesting um, point I'd like to bring up. How does one account in science or in brain science for the um, activity of sublimation, or is it accounted for? Because it certainly is apparent to me that, and I just gave a talk on Louise Bourgeois, who talked about it all her life, um, that her sexual drive was sublimated in her her work. That was the manifestation of her work. Now, it, does sublimation play a role, or have they found 
does it play a role in the synapses that occur in the brain? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think there may be an, an interesting historical example with Herman Melville. Um, Herman Melville wrote several very popular novels, Omu, Taipei, and so forth, in the 1840s. He was highly ta talented, but not particularly original. And then something happened around 1850. He fell in love, and in fact, he fell in love uh, with Nathaniel Hawthorne. Oh. And this was not reciprocated. Mm. And therefore, the libido had no, didn't have its normal outlet. And um, it was in this state of uh, passion and restraint that Moby Dick emerged. Oh. Uh, I want to understand how the new can come into being. Uh, and uh, this, this um, uh, again, to, uh, I want to give, give a, a concrete example. A little bit was said earlier about imitation being bad. Mm -hmm. I think imitation may be an essential preliminary to any achievement. And for example, with a, uh, uh, a poet like Pope, like Alexander Pope, his first published poems were called Imitations of English Poets. And um, he is first concerned to to get the technique or to develop the language, as, as you said, Richard, and only when it's developed, he then infuses it with his imagination. Um, but you can't have anything new until a great deal has become automatic and second nature. But um, it is, uh, uh, I think the spontaneous, spontaneity and novelty uh, are the most challenging problems in the world. When we were at Yale... We they, being you and Richard. Was, yeah, uh, and you know, there were so many other interesting people there at the same time. Um, we unabashedly worked through other people's work. We were students, and we... Uh, I mean, you could always tell who Richard was into because all the pages of the book were glued together with paint. Because his books would be spread in his studio, and he would work through, you know, Suti, and he worked through everybody. And we knew that we were doing that as an exercise. We were not appropriating. And I think what Oliver's saying is very true. You get your chops by, uh, by digesting other people's creativity. And that will put you in a position where once you leave it alone, you're going to be able to find something more personal. But I think what it says is that it's not just newness, it's greatness. Because unless the yes. newness contains yes. within it what something. came before, it's not going to achieve that stature. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. systems and limitations free up intuition. When I was free to do anything I wanted to do, I did the same things over and over and over. Once I constructed a situation in which I, uh, you know, I couldn't do certain things, uh, I found that those limitations, rather than constricting me and rather than limiting what I could do, uh, on the other, uh, on the contrary, opened things up, and I was far more intuitive than I ever had been without those limitations.